So hello to those of you who haven't joined us so far. Um, this is the third webinar of our series. Um, my name is Emma and I'm the member of the WPMN events team who's responsible for running the series. And basically this UCAT series is designed to introduce you to the test. Um, so hopefully we're catching you all as you're just starting to think about your UCAT preparation. Um, so we're hoping to introduce you to each of the subsections, take you through some of our strategies and tips, um, and then run through some work examples with you all. Before we get started, um, as with every webinar, we're just going to run through a couple of quick safety points. So um, you won't be able to use your camera or microphone during the event um, purely for safeguarding reasons. It just makes it easier to manage larger numbers of you guys. Um, and same with the chat function. Um, so we're going to keep that off for the majority of the event. We are going to use poll functions this week um, for when we're doing mock questions. So Dana shall take you through all of that when we come to doing some mock questions. Um, as with last week, I'm going to pop a link to a Google form in the chat box. And if you submit any of the questions you have throughout the event via this Google form, um, it'll just allow me to collate questions as we go and um, we can answer those at the end, depending on how much time we've got left. As you're aware, um, the event is being recorded, but only the presentation and the speaker will be visible. So you'll be completely unidentifiable in the recording. The chat function is not recorded. Um, this is purely so we can upload it to our YouTube account afterwards um, and allow you guys to watch it back. Um, and just to mention, because we get asked this lots and lots throughout every webinar, um, you will get the PowerPoint for this. So I'll send the PowerPoint out tomorrow and the recording will be available on the WPMN YouTube account, hopefully within the next few weeks um, after our YouTube team has a chance to edit and upload. So a very, very brief spiel about WPMN. Um, so we're a national charitable organisation that are working towards building a medical workforce that's wholly representative of the population it serves. So we really believe that medicine's a career that should be accessible to everyone. Um, and to that end, we support you guys as aspiring doctors, um, but also current medical students and um, doctors themselves. We were founded by um, Dr. Jade Scott Bell Grove, whose um, picture's on the screen at the minute in March 2020, so at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, and have since grown to over 600 members. So it's completely free to join um, on our website. So if you haven't done that already, I um, would encourage you to have a little look at the website. There are lots of resources for aspiring medical students and lots of contacts for those of you who maybe want to chat to someone who goes to a specific university. So if you've not had a wee look at the website, I um, would definitely recommend you do. And as always, a quick thank you to the University of Glasgow who have been sponsoring this series um, and they've provided us with a large Zoom licence to allow us to host as many of you as possible. Um, but just uh, we note that um, any content within the webinar is representative of WPMN and not the University of Glasgow Medical School. And additionally, a thank you to the UCAT Consortium themselves for granting us permission to use questions from the UCAT's official website for their series. Um, and they've also helped us out with a little bit of advertising as well. But just to note again that we don't represent the UCAT Consortium um, and we were not involved in the creation of questions or marking schemes used within the presentation. So again, I'm just going to run through a couple of brief UCAT overview slides. Um, so apologies to those of you who have heard this already. Um, so the UCAT is an admissions test used by medical and dental schools across the UK um, and slightly further afield in some cases. There are two admissions tests that are used, the UCAT being one of them. Um, and you can see the universities that use the UCAT here. The other test you might come across is the BMAT. Um, and there are only a handful of medical and dental schools in the UK that use that. And that is um, Brighton and Sussex, Imperial College London, Lancaster, University College London, Leeds, Cambridge and Oxford. So those are the BMAT universities, all of the UCAT universities you'll see on the screen here. Um, but basically, just to be aware, when you're applying to medical schools or dental schools to make sure that you're sitting or have sat the appropriate admissions test for the university you're interested in. And this is the key dates for um, this test cycle. So registration is already opened. Um, so you can register online for your UCAT account. Um, and importantly, through this, you can access the bursary scheme and the access arrangements, which I'll cover very briefly next. 
Um, but I guess the other important date to highlight this week is that booking opens on the 20th of June, so that's next Monday. Um, so before we come back next week, you will have been able to start booking your UCAT. Um, so keep that date in mind. Make sure you register for your account and book your test as soon as possible. The test, as you all hopefully know, does come with a fee. So in the UK, it's £70. Um, you may be eligible for a bursary to cover this cost. Um, so all of the criteria for this uh, is available on the UCAT website. So, for example, if you get any of the 16 to 19 bursary or the EMA up in Scotland, um, anything like that, make sure you just have a wee look to see if you would be eligible to have that covered. Um, you can apply for this bursary now um, and you'll basically get a voucher that you can use when you're booking your test. So really, you want to get applying for the bursary scheme now. Um, so when booking opens next week, you're able to able to use that, basically. And similarly with access arrangements, so if you normally get any extra time um, when you're sitting exams at school or you have any other um, accommodations that the school makes for you when you're sitting exams, um, they can arrange this for your UCAT, um, but essentially it has to be approved in advance of your test day. So you can't pitch up on your test day and be like, oh, I get 25% extra time and um, they won't allow it. So you need to make sure you get that sourced in advance of the test. And ideally before you book your test. So that's something, again, along with the bursary that you want to be sorting this week if it applies to you. Um, and this is just an overview of the UCAT itself. So we've already covered um, verbal reasoning and decision making. Um, so this week we're going to be covering quantitative reasoning. But you can see here that the test is 120 minutes long or 115 minutes for answering questions, plus a minute to read the instructions for each section. Um, and it's divvied up into five sections, each with varying numbers of questions and varying lengths of time associated. Um, so yeah, we're gonna cover the quantitative reasoning section tonight, um, and we'll be covering abstract next week and situational judgment the week after. And in terms of the score for your UCAT, um, it's, they do score it rather strangely. Um, so for each of the first four sections, you get a score between 300 and 900, which gives you a total score of 1,200 to 3,600. And then you get a band for your situational judgment. Basically, results are available on the day you set your test. Um, so you set your test at the same place that you would set your driving theory test. Um, and you basically come out of the test room and they'll print off your results there and then. Um, and then they'll also be available within 24 hours online. All right, so that is my introduction spiel. Um, took me less than 10 minutes this week. <laughs> so I will stop talking and hand you over to Danish, who's got a fantastic presentation on quantitative reasoning for you all. Okay, thank you, Emma. Um, okay, guys, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Uh, today we're going over the quantitative reasoning section. Uh, just to check, you can see my screen and everything okay, right? Yep, we're all good. Okay, cool, cool. So um, just a quick introduction uh, about myself. Um, I want to know who you're being taught by. So um, I'm a second year medical student at Aberdeen University. I actually just finished my second year, so I'm going into third year. And I'm a biomedical science graduate as well. So I'm 24, slightly older than <laughs> the average second year student. Um, and I've been doing a lot of stuff with UCAT, personal statement, MMI interview prep for the last two years. So since I started medicine, I've been doing a lot of tutoring and all of these things. I do kind of like one-to-one -one mentoring for medicine. And I've also been just tutoring and teaching for about six years now. So here's what you should expect today. So this is just an overview of what we're going to go through. I'm going to start off by going through the basics of the quantitative reasoning section. Some of you will, this will be like your first time looking at the QR section. So I'm gonna go through the very basics and cover every question type that we have. For each of the different question types, I'll talk you through different tips and techniques that you can use. It's not as simple as, a, as the exams you do in school where you just answer the questions. There's other techniques with how you answer them and whether you skip questions, et cetera. And we'll go into those today. Um, there's quite a lot of question types in QR. So you guys have had the talk on verbal reasoning and I believe decision-making so far. In QR, there's so many question types compared to the other two. So it will take a while to get through those, which is why I put a seven minute break in. So at some point today, maybe around 
I think 40, 45 minutes is when attention span goes away. So we'll take a break at that point and then we'll come back and do some live timed practice questions. We'll go through the answers for all questions today. And we'll also do some, uh, I'll talk you guys through keyboard shortcuts and then give you some advice. And I'll show you the UCAT calculator before we do the Q&A. Just because this is the QR section, you will need something today. You'll need something to write on. So ideally a whiteboard and pen. I say that because in your UCAT exam, it's a whiteboard and a pen that you will be given in the test center to write on. So I think it's good that when you're practicing at home, you're using the same kind of mode that you'll be using in the exam. Also a calculator um, in your UCAT exam, the calculator is on the computer. So if you can, if you have one on your computer, that's more ideal. Um, I will talk more about the calculator later on, but just as of now, the calculator is going to be an online one. So kind of get used to typing the numbers on the keypad on your, um, on the keyboard. So we're going to be doing practice questions today, have these ready, and I'll give you a warning before we're about to do a question just so that you can get everything ready. So just to start, let's go through the basics of the QR section. Uh, quantitative reasoning is the full name, but I'm going to refer to this as QR for the rest of today. So this is the third section of the UCAT. I'm sure you know that by now. There'll be verbal reasoning first, then decision-making, and then QR. Just a note on the different order of sections. They are all exams in the UCAT are in that same order that you've seen before. So verbal reasoning, decision-making, and then QR third. Um, try not to let the previous section like cloud your mind and get you stressed out about the next section. Sometimes you do a section and it might not be your best. And it can be very easy to have that one minute in between and take the negative energy into the next section. Try to look at each section with a fresh perspective, like it's a new section. It's another opportunity for you to do your best and hopefully you'll do your best in QR after today's session. Um, this, this section has 36 questions and you have 25 minutes. It's after abstract, reason, abstract reasoning. This one is the one where you're most tight for time. So you have around 40 seconds per question. I think if you calculate it, it's 41.6 seconds per question which is quite short. So after today, I'm gonna to show you guys techniques, how you can get through these much quicker. Um, sounds like a short amount of time and uh, it really is, but there are some questions you'll be able to do very quickly and some that you'll, will take you a little bit longer. So it's all about finding the balance between the two. And the purpose of the QR, I honestly found that when I was doing the UCAT test, I continuously asked myself, why do I need to do this? Why is this relevant to medicine or dentistry? And does hold some relevance and you'll probably realize it over the next few years. Maybe when you get into med school, dentistry school, it's basically to test your ability to make decisions when, you, when you're tight for time. So the fact that you have 40 seconds to do these calculations, it kind of simulates the hospital environment. For example, you may have a patient and you have to make a decision very quickly based on their observations. And you might have to do a quick calculation. And it literally is like time is money. You need to do things very, very quickly. So it's testing your ability in a stressful situation like that. The questions will involve addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, percentages, and ratios. Nothing today will exceed GCSE maths level. So if you haven't done maths since GCSEs, don't worry. This is not going to, we're not going to go through anything complex. The questions are actually themselves quite simple and quite easy. What makes them very difficult is the way that they write the data out and the way that they word the questions and also the time limit. I think the hardest thing about this section is purely the time limit. If you were given, you know, like two, three minutes per question, you would get 100%. It's really not that difficult. It's all about the time, <laughs> which stresses people out. Uh, but don't worry, we'll go through some tips and you'll be fine at the end. As I said before, the calculator is provided it's online. Uh, at the end of today's session, we'll do a live demo where I go on the UCAT website and I show you exactly what the calculator looks like. I'm also going to run through the different um, keyboard shortcuts that you can use for that as well. And I've just said this before, so questions are quite straightforward. It's timing that makes them difficult. And there are no, there's no negative marking for incorrect answers. So if you get a question wrong, it's fine. You don't lose any marks. So make sure you put an answer for absolutely everything. Even if you didn't have any time to read and you're just guessing, just put a guess down and then continue. Whiteboard, I mentioned this before as well. So whiteboard, marker pen and wipes will be provided in the exam. If you have these at home, try to practice with them. So try to practice with, I think it's like five sheets of A4 in whiteboard form that you get in the exam. And they're double-sided. 
um, and you just get a whiteboard pen and they give you wipes so you can rub out the um, the writing that you've written. Um, if you can practice with that, that will be, it will kind of get you used to using a whiteboard rather than pen and paper. Uh, you're not allowed to use pen and paper in the exam. It has to be the form that they give you. Try not to write too big. This is my advice. In my exam, I remember running out of space when I was writing and it kind of stressed me out because I had to quickly put my hand up, ask for more sheets and it just delays you by a few seconds and every second is precious. So try to write small if you're gonna write something. And after you've done kind of a section of working out for a question, maybe draw a line around it so that that, air, that bit of working out is separated from the rest of the writing. Um, if you find that you're running out of space, just put your hand up before you finish the space and say, can I have some more whiteboards please? And then they should give you, uh, they should give you them before you need them. And that's that. Okay, so now we're going to run through the different question types. Brace yourselves, joking, this is going to be fine. Um, the first one is basic arithmetic. So I'm sure you guys all know these. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Um, these questions are, are arguably the easiest. They literally just ask you to add, or subtract different things using data. But mistakes can be easily made, right? The questions sometimes will have uh, a graph, and things might be written in descending order. Or they, when you would normally write a graph, you might put male, female, male, female, but they might have male, female, female, male uh, with the way that they've written the data in. Just little things like that that can quite easily catch you up. And sometimes you might have a, a bar chart or a pie chart on this on screen, and it looks like the numbers in the pie chart are exactly what you should be using. But there might be a sentence at the top which says something like, um, all of the figures are... Um, you, for some reason you need to add one to all of the figures or something like that. So make sure you're kind of looking at the whole data set and you're not caught out by these little tactics that they use. Um, and pay attention to units as well. Uh, in a lot of the questions, you'll find that it seems very simple, but then you realize that something's written in centimeters and another thing is written in meters. There'll be questions later on today on geometry. So you know we're working out the area or the perimeter of a shape, but they won't put all of the units in the same form. Some will be meters, some will be centimeters, some will be millimeters. And it's a very easy mistake to make by assuming they're all the same. So we're gonna try an example now. I'm gonna give you guys 40 seconds. Let's get my watch ready. 40 seconds is roughly how much you would have. I just wanna say before we try this example, please don't be disheartened if 40 seconds seems like a very, a very short amount of time or if you don't get any of the answers in that much time. Today is day one of you guys doing the QR section. Literally everybody who does the QCAT starts off really struggling with the time. In a few weeks time, once you've had a bit of practice and you've done this a few times, it will be much easier for you to do in that time frame. So 40 seconds starts now, and this is your question. Okay, that's 40 seconds up. Um, don't worry if you didn't manage to get the answer in time. Uh, I can see that there's, it's gonna end the poll here. Or some people are still answering. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Okay, I'll end it there. So it seems like there's a mixture between, mostly most people go for E. So we've got 36% with E and 27% went for C. Um, this is, the answer, so the correct response was E. Basically, this question is asking you, um, saying the temperature between Venus, uh, Earth, and uh, temperature between Venus is halfway between the temperature on Earth and the temperature on Mercury. So what is the temperature on Mercury? Basically, this 480 and 20 degrees, the distance between those 460, that makes up half of the distance between Earth's temperature and Mercury's temperature. So you do 480 minus 20 to get this, this gap. And you have to add this onto 480 to bring this up 940. Now, just a little tip for this question, guys. You don't need to use your calculator for this. 
Everyone can do 480 minus 20 in your heads. We know that's 460. To do 480 plus 460, if you just think about that math, <laughs> that, um, that for example, 400 plus 400 is 800. Look at the five answers. There's only one answer, which is over 460. The rest of them are under 460. It's literally impossible for it to be anything other than E once you know that you're doing 480 plus 460. That technique is called eyeballing. So you just have a look and you think, okay, 480 plus 460 is going to be somewhere around 800, 900, maybe 1,000. And you look at the answers and you think, well, it's got to be E. Okay, so that's something that you want to be getting used to for this exam. Any moment where you find something you can do with mental maths, do it with mental maths. Don't use your calculator for everything because it's a waste of time, especially adding or taking away 10 or 20. And uh, look out for this because this question can be done pretty quickly. Uh, when you guys have got the slide afterwards, if you go through this again, you'll find that it's probably 10, 15 seconds. And that saves you another 25 seconds for uh, another question. Got another question here. Um, should have warned you about that one. So there's another question. Uh, I'm going to give you another 40 seconds. Um, this time, keep in mind what I just told you. So remember the eyeballing thing, how you might not have to actually do the calculation. You can sort of gauge how what roughly what the number is going to be. So I'm going to restart the poll. Okay, and you have 40 seconds once again for this question. Okay, that's 40 seconds up. So I just end the poll and share the results. So most of you went for C as the answer. Um, the answer, correct answer is D on this question. So if we have a look at here, basically it's asking you to calculate the difference in votes between the first and second party in September. So you need to look at the September total section at the bottom. And you can see that there's four totals here. And there's three groups, A, B, and C. This end column here says did not vote. This is not a group. So one thing that can easily catch you out here is to do 1,413 take away 711. And one of the answers corresponds to that number. So you don't want to go for that one. The two top, um, two top part parties are party C and party A. So 711 take away 494. And that gives you your answer D, 217. Okay, actually, just to mention on this question, um, that's, an, that's an example of how they can catch you out with the way they've written the question. So it's a common mistake for people to just look at the numbers quickly. I think September totals, 1,413, 711. And it even feels like you're doing it correctly because you've just quickly had a look, but make sure you have a look at which column you're reading and make sure this is actually the totals. The other tip, which I'm going to come to later on, but I'm going to just give it you as a, a pre-tip now, is that you should actually, it sounds counterintuitive, but you should read the final part of the question first. So here at the bottom, it says, calculate the difference in votes between the first and second party in September. You don't really need to read this sentence, this one here, or the one at the top. All you need is this final one. You're just calculating the, the difference of votes between the first and second party in September. Okay, cool. First party C, second party A, take them away from each other, 217. That's your thought process in this question to do it as quickly as possible. What you should do is start with reading this part here. Sometimes you might actually need some information from before. So if that's the case, read this first and then go back to the top and double check if you need anything else. But more often than not, you can answer the question with just the question itself, which seems very weird to not read the whole question and take your time like you're used to in exams. But for the UCAT, this is one of the best techniques, especially for the QR section. Okay, there are two types of questions you're going to see, simple and complex questions. If there's one tip you guys take from today, this is the number one tip, which is gonna help you score high in the QR section. 
in the QR section, you're going to get some questions and they require three or four mathematical calculations to get to the answer. And you'll get other questions like the one you just did, which literally have one calculation to get to the answer. All of the questions in the QR section are worth one mark each. So it makes sense for you to spend most of your time doing the one, the one step questions, the ones that have one calculation or two calculations to get to the answer. So learn to spot the difference between these questions. So complex questions are anything that has two or more calculations. Simple questions have two or less. Um, they're both worth a mark each, so don't waste your time on a complex one. Um, aim to complete all of the simple questions first, then go back to the complex questions. And I'll show you a framework for how you can manage both of these. So you, you first, you look at the question, scan the question, have a look. Is this question a simple one or is it a long one? You should be able to tell quite quickly if this is going to take a bit more than just one or two calculations. If you find that it's a simple question, just do the question. Okay, answer the question, get yourself that nice easy mark and then move on to the next. If you find that this is a complex question and it's gonna take you two or three calculations, maybe even more, then eyeball the answers firstly. So have a look if there's anything you can maybe, um, maybe guess and guess the question. Flag the question and move on. The reason I say this is in the time that you answer a question which is complex, you could have probably answered three, maybe four simple questions. So you could have got three or four marks in the time you're wasting on that one complex question. The best students, the students who score highly on the QR section, they do this very well. They skip all the complex ones and they maximize all these simple questions. And then at the end of the test, you can press a button which takes you through all of the flagged questions. And that's when you go through complex questions. But one thing to keep your mind on is make sure you actually guess these questions. Don't just flag them and move on and leave them without an answer. Because in that case, if you didn't, if you completely ran out of time, you would leave some questions unanswered and there's no negative marking. So you should never leave any question unanswered in this section. Even if you didn't get time to read it, you should put a guess down because at least you might guess the correct answer. Okay, the next section of uh, types of questions is proportionality. So this is basically working out direct and indirect proportions of something. So for example, it's like the increase or decrease of a price of an item in a sale. It might ask you the reverse of that as well. It might tell you that a t-shirt costs 15 pounds and it was increased by 30%. What was the original price? Right? This is proportions asking you increase and decrease. Um, in these questions, you need to pay attention to the units. So I've mentioned this before, they can quite easily trick you with the units, euros, pounds, dollars. They might give you all of them in a question. Um, centimeters and meters as well. Just anything, anytime you see units, pay attention because when you're, when you're doing the UCAT, you're doing things so quickly. Time is so short that you almost forget to look at the units. And what they do is in the answers, they will put an answer there, which is incorrect, which, is, uh, which you can only get from using the wrong units together. So that's one thing to keep an eye out for. Um, the currency conversions, there will be some questions where they require you to convert between pounds and dollars. We're going to come to those questions later on on their own because they're in a different section. So don't worry about that. Now we're going to try another example question. I'm just going to close the poll from before and start a new one. So once again, you guys will have 40 seconds for this question. Now I've taught you guys a few things so far. So I've told you that read the question first rather than scanning the data. So I want you to read the question, like I said before, before you start the question as well, and um, try and eyeball the answers as well. If you find there's something you can do with mental math, so you can kind of gauge what the answer is going to be, try and use that. So your 40 seconds for this question start now. Okay, that's 40 seconds up. Don't worry guys, if you didn't manage to finish that question in time, um, 
this is literally your first time trying this and it's completely expected. Like I don't expect anybody to be comfortable doing these questions in the time. So if you're getting these questions in the time frame that I'm giving you, that's very good. And if you're not, don't worry. Like over when you practice these over time, you'll you'll get used to it. So the majority of you went with answer C. Uh, a couple more going for D and some going for B. And uh, the correct answer for this is actually D. So what I think might have gone wrong here is you have coin A and coin B, and it says that coin A and uh, coin B are both made of nickel and copper. It says, what is the difference between the weight of copper present in coin B and the weight of copper present in coin A? This table is telling you the percentage of weight of nickel. Okay, so immediately you might just think, okay, what percentage of weight? And just use these percentages. So you might have done 25% of 6.5, take away 16% of five, but that's incorrect. That's actually telling you nickel. So you need to do the, the rest of it because the coins are made of nickel and copper. So you do 75% for coin A, take away 84% um, coin B, okay? So that's because this is telling you nickel and you want to know about copper because the question says the weight of copper present in coin B and copper in coin A. So again, that's a very easy mistake to make. Also in this question, you can eyeball some of the stuff. So I just did that in my head, right? 100 take a 25, 100 take away 16. You don't need to do that. And um, you don't need to use a calculator for those calculations. And when you're calculating the percentage of something, um, I don't know what they've used here. So this is from the UCAT website and they've done 6.5 times 75 over 100. I personally don't do that. If I need to find the percentage of something, I times the number by the percent percentage as a decimal. So if I want to know 75% of 6.5, you do 6.5 times by 0 0.75, okay? 75% is 0 0.75 as a decimal, and that will give you the answer directly. And that's one calculation you have to put into your calculator. Doing this, timesing by 75 and dividing by 100, this is two. I know it sounds very silly, but like it literally makes a difference. Those three or four seconds that you save by not typing divide by 100, just simply timesing by 0 0.75 will save you time. Okay, now onto the next question type is percentages. So these are common questions in the QR section. You are bound to see these when you do your test. These are something that you need to be familiar with and you should practice these before because it is basically a guarantee that this is going to come up. It's just simple things like working out the percentage of number. So it might give you a pie chart, and it asks you what percentage of the class are boys, and you have to calculate that. Uh, also, percentage increase or decreases as well. So again, it might show you the price of something before and after uh, a sale, and ask you what the percentage increase or decrease is. And you also need to be comfortable converting between percentages, fractions, and decimals. So for example, 30% is 0 0.3 is 3 out of 10. Let's try an example question. I just want to give you a quick point here before we do the question. Um, things like percentages, ratios, um, some of you might not have done these kind of basic maths concepts since GCSEs, even if you're doing A-level maths. Doing something like percentages isn't what you really do in A-level maths. So if you're out of practice with these kind of questions, <clears throat> what I used to do is I would just go on Google and type in um, GCSE percentage questions, and I would sit and do 50 in a row. And I would do that purely just to get used to doing those calculations and doing them very quickly and also making sure I get all of them correct. And doing that for all of the different types of questions that I mentioned today, that's really going to help you with your speed. And just it becomes almost like muscle memory. You'll just look at the question and you'll know exactly what calculation to do because you're so used to doing them. So if you, want, if you feel like you need to brush up on your math skills, literally start by doing a GCSE question bank. Just type in Google percentages increase questions GCSE and you'll find some website somewhere and you can just do that. Now I'm going to open the poll again. I'm going to give you 40 seconds for the next question and this question is about percentages. So we launch poll. Okay cool. So 40 seconds off you go.
Okay, that's 40 seconds up. Okay, you guys did really well with this one. 69% of you chose C. Uh, the correct answer is C. Let's just stop sharing that. Oh, forgive me. That says I've colored D on there by accident. That's the answer is meant to be C. <laughs> That's a mistake on the color there. Um, okay, so this question is quite a simple one. Again, you can do a lot of eyeballing on this. Um, this first calculation here, 35 plus 72 plus 20 plus 60. Now you may want to do that on your calculator, but adding 20 and 60, it's just a waste of time. It's 80, right? Everyone, I'm sure you guys can figure that out. It's 80 in your head. Um, if you want to do the whole thing in your head and you're confident doing that as well, 100% go for it because the more time you can save, the less you can use, the less you use your calculator, the more time you save. Um, and yeah, that's all. Cool. Next question type is ratios. So obviously you're applying ratios to solve a problem. Uh, things to remember with ratios is the order that they're written in. Okay. Uh, this is very key because the answers will actually show you the ratio in both, both ways, flipped uh, with one with the numbers either way, and only one of them is going to be correct. So if I tell you the ratio of boys to girls is one to seven, that's not the same as girls to boys one to seven. Okay, go boys to girls means boys come first and girls come second, and it's one and then seven. So even when you're doing your calculations, this makes a big difference to try not to get mixed up by that. Um, make sure you're familiar with the ratios. And like I said before, if ratios are something that you struggle with, um, make sure you do some practice questions. Just literally get the GCSE question bank up and practice those until you're comfortable with them. And yeah, that's what I've just mentioned there. So make sure you do GCSE practice questions if you need to. Um, I did many before my test. Uh, it had been many years before I'd done this kind of GCSE maths. So it's very helpful, honestly. Dual ratios can be used as well. So this is kind of like a step up from your average ratios. For example, if I tell you the ratio of x to y is one to two, and I tell you the ratio of x to z is one to three, can you work out from these two what the ratio of y to z would be? I'm just gonna give you like five more seconds. You can figure that out if you had. So, the ratio of y to z, given these two ratios, would be two to three, because they're, they're both being compared to x here. You can see y is two to one, not compared to x, and z is three to one. So x is the common variable, which means y to z would be two to three. It's important that you're able to do this. Some of the questions, they might give you x to y is one to two and x to z is one to three, but to answer the question, you might need to know what the ratio of y to z is. And you can only work that out if you're familiar doing this. Uh, this is a rare example. So don't expect this to come up in like frequently, but it's something that you should know just in case. Yeah, so this is the more complex kind of ratio question that will involve this. And we're going to do another example question. So I'll restart the poll. Once again, you'll have 40 seconds for this. And again, try and as we're going through, I'm hoping that you guys are picking up on the the hints and tips I'm giving you. So make sure you read the question first, you pay attention to the units and um, try to see if you can get this one. So 40 seconds starts now. Okay, that's around 40 seconds up. Actually quite an even mix of all the answers this time. Just gonna end the poll there and share the results. So you can see that the most common answer was give, given was B here. And the second most common was C. And the correct answer was B in this question. So you guys did well there. Um, so basically this question is asking you about the men. It's kind of wordy, this question. So. I would recommend as you're doing the question, you kind of write down on, with your pen the, uh, what it's asking you. 
So when I did this question myself, I, I, had to, I physically had to write it down as I was reading the question. Otherwise, it kind of confused me. So if 10% of the men who said they cannot taste PTC could in fact taste PTC at higher concentrations, right? already 10% of the men who cannot taste PTC. So men cannot taste PTC, there are 60. 10% of those men would be six. Okay, this is something you can calculate in your head. You just divide it by 10. If they could, in fact, taste BTC at higher concentrations, that means that the number here of men who cannot taste should be reduced by six because 10% of them said that they can actually taste it. So what would the ratio of men who can taste PTC to men who cannot taste PTC at higher concentrations be? So what they've done is they found out that it's 10%, which is six, and those six people can actually taste it. So you add it onto the 72, which gives you the 78. But you have to remember, you took six away from the 60, which gives you 54. And then your ratio is 78 to 54. And to make the jump from there left to the right is simply divide by two. If you're doing ratios, that's the safest thing to do. Just divide them both by two. More often than not, it should give you your answer. Um, very rarely, they would ask you to divide by three. These, uh, these two are divisible by three, so you could go further, but the answer is right there. Um, just a tip here as well. You can see 78 divided by two is 39, and there's three questions here, three answers with 39. But for the second number, 54, the answer is 27. There is only one answer with 27. So if you kind of eyeball the question, uh, or if you're just kind of figuring out what 78 divided by two is, you might think, oh, it's 39, but there's three of them. So skip dividing 78, divide 54 first. And if you realize 54 divided by two is 27, you know that the answer has to have 27 as the second part of the ratio. So you don't need to figure out what 78 is. You can comfortably pick the only answer, which is B that has 27. That's just a small thing that can help you save you a little bit of time from dividing 78 by two. Okay, the next question type is speed, distance, and time. Just stop sharing that. So this is the most, um, this is using the formula speed equals distance divided by time. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. So this is the little triangle that they kind of teach you in school about speed, distance, and time. You cover up the answer that you're trying to figure out. So if I'm figuring out distance, I cover up distance and I'm left with speed times time. And the same for if you're covering up speed, it's different distance divided by time. Um, obviously calculating how long fast or far an object has traveled. This is the most common question in the QR section. They love these questions for some reason. Um, I guess given that it's easily, it's easy to write questions on and there's so many ways you can use this formula. Uh, it'll definitely be on your test, okay? So <laughs> make sure you know this. Um, there's not gonna be loads of questions on this, but for sure you're gonna see at least one or two. So that's how you use the triangle and be comfortable with rearranging this as well. So sometimes they might give you two of them. It might, um, the question might involve more calculations, but you have to figure out the distance first, and then you have to use that to do this triangle. Um, but yeah, speed, distance, and time, very common questions. And just to add to that, you may have to calculate acceleration too. So speed, distance, and time is this formula here, but acceleration is this formula. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. This basically means a change in velocity divided by a change in time. So Change in velocity means if a car is driving five miles per hour and it speeds up to 20 miles per hour, the change in velocity is 15, okay? It's increased its speed by 15 miles per hour. And the change in time is how long it took the car to increase its speed. So if it took 10 seconds, that's 10 seconds at the bottom and it would be 15 at the top. So if a car is slowing down, the, the value for acceleration is negative. Okay, so if my car is going 20 miles per hour and then it goes down to 10 miles per hour, it's a negative value. So keep that in mind. If the question asks you how, what's the acceleration of this car and the car is slowing down, pick the answer which is negative because that's the correct one. It's not positive. Positive is increasing speed. So we're going to do an example question. Once again, 40 seconds on the clock starting now.
Okay, that's just about 40 seconds done. Um, right, you guys smashed that one. That's the best one so far. Uh, I've got 80, just about 80% of you, the correct answer. I'm just gonna end that poll there. So the correct answer for this is A. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not a fan of these long explanations here. I'm just gonna give you my own. So this question does not require a calculator. Um, you can do this all in your head. So you know that the formula for acceleration is change in velocity divided by change in time, right? So car A and car B is what you're trying to calculate. So what, how much greater is the acceleration of car A than acceleration of car B? So you're basically comparing them both. Car A is going from starts at zero miles meters per second, and it increases to 16. So at the top of this equation, you have 16, and it's done this in four seconds. So you can see along the x-axis, it's four seconds, 16 divided by four is four. Car B has no change in velocity, okay? Starts at eight, finishes at eight, that is zero. If you put a zero at the top of any fraction, it's zero. It doesn't matter what number's on the bottom. So you don't need to calculate time or anything. You know it's zero. So A is four, B is zero, the difference is four. Okay, so the next one is money, income, and exchange rates. Personally, I think these are the hardest questions, for me anyway. Um, it's just because they're not things that you don't really do. And these questions have the most data in them. So it usually shows a spreadsheet or something, maybe somebody's income, maybe um, someone's bank statements. And you normally have to calculate something like the amount of tax that they have to pay. Or sometimes you might have to calculate the amount of tax they have to pay in a different currency. So they often require a lot of calculations. And remember earlier, I told you, if you do a complex question, um, just guess it and move on. It's not worth your time, honestly. So if you see something with the money, make sure you keep that in mind. Okay, if it's a complex question, guess the question and move on. Spend your time doing the easier questions instead. Um, you would get something like this. You'd be given the conversion rates. So you'd be told it's one pound to $1.4 or something like that. And um, keep an eye on the units. Okay, if something's written in pounds or if it's in dollars, even if it's in a table where you would expect everything to be in the same unit, it's not always the case. So keep that in your the back of your mind um it can be quite uh, overwhelming in the exam you know you're working so quickly you're just in question after question in that moment it's very easy to just forget to read the units so always remind yourself okay got to check the units got to make sure i'm doing everything correctly and again i recommend practicing these calculations with gcse questions i don't remember doing any of these types of questions in a-level maths so if um if you're unfamiliar with this, if it's been a while, honestly, doing the GCSE questions online helps so much. Um, it really boosted my scores. As soon as I did them, I found these were pretty easy to do. Um, I sort of found these tricky to wrap my head around first when I was converting pounds to dollars and back and forth. And this is another thing as well when you're selecting numbers. So it might tell you um, if it's money, income, and exchange rates. Sometimes there are two figures in the table and you need one of them. And it might be an original price versus new price, for example. Um, this is just an example I saw whilst I was looking at practice questions and it's quite easy to pick the wrong one. So little words like original or the new price or price before the sale, after the sale, make sure you're reading those carefully. Um, but these questions, there are several methods. In fact, with everything in maths, there are a number of ways to do this. Earlier on, I showed you the percentages, how you can just times by the percentage as a decimal, but you can also, if you're trying to find 20% of something, you can times by 20 and divide by 100. Um, I think anyway. Uh, try and get familiar with the techniques which involve the least steps, purely because it saves you more time. It might not be your most comfortable type of calculation, but in this exam, every second you save, is valuable because if you save one second per question that's at least 30 that's about 36 seconds you've saved and that's enough to do another question and that's another mark that one mark can make a very big difference in your score so we're going to do another example question i'm going to give you guys 40 seconds in about a second i'm just going to set the poll up again so i'm sure you've noticed by now the practice questions are related to the topic that we're doing so this is a money and income exchange rates type question. So 40 seconds starting now.
Okay, that's 40 seconds up. I'm going to give you guys 10 more seconds. I know this one's a tough question. So just carry on if you're going. Okay, and I'll end the poll there. So it looks like most of you chose C as the answer. Second most common answer was B with 19% of you. And the correct answer, answer is actually B. So just to run through this one, we talk, the, it asks you to the nearest dollar, the income tax he has to pay is. So we're looking at this guy called Bill. He has an annual taxable income of $28,950. And you're just calculating how much income tax he has to pay. So 28,950 would fall into this bracket here where my mouse is. So the first bracket is up to 8,950 and Bill's earning 28,950. So we need to take off 8,950 first because he pays 895 on this amount. That, that, for, that um, calculation you can do in your head, okay? 28,950 take away 8,950. You're literally just taking up these last four numbers. It leaves you with $20,000. So that's an example where you can just do something in your head. You don't need to use your calculator. So you're left with 20,000 and on the 20,000, he's paying 15% tax rate. So you do the 50% calculation, you do 20,000 times by 0 0.15, and that will give you 3,000. And then you add your 3,000 to 895. Because remember from zero to 8,950, he's paying 895 pounds. And then for the rest of the money, which is £20,000, he's paying 15%. And then you add those two together, which gives you 3895. Um, yeah, these questions simply will just take time getting used to. Uh, I imagine it was maybe a bit overwhelming. You open the question and you just see loads of numbers. Personally, I never like these. So there's percentages involved in this one. There's addition and there's also um, just table reading. So this is like a two or three step question. I would probably skip this question in the exam. I would look at it and think, okay, I need to do a few calculations here. I'm gonna guess this one, flag the question and move on. Make sure if you're guessing a question, you flag the question as well. Because if you don't flag the question, and when you come back to the flagged questions at the end, this one won't show up for you. So you need to make sure that you flag the ones that you're guessing. Okay, next section is geometry, which is area and volume of shapes. Um, there are a few formulas you need to know for this one, and we're gonna run through those. So the basic thing is area, perimeter, and volume calculations. So you guys will know what these are. Area is obviously shape, the inside the shape, perimeters, adding up the sides, and then volume is 3D space. Um, the simple shapes you'll get, squares, triangles, circles, rectangles. I'm sure you know for squares and, tri uh, squares and rectangles, it's just base times uh, width and length times by each other. For circles, you need to know the formula. So for area, pi r squared. And for the diameter, pi times diameter. If you're ever using pi in a question, the question will tell you what to use as pi. So it will say use 3.14 as pi. Um, the calculator in the exam doesn't have a pi button. So it will always tell you use 3.14 or maybe just use the pi symbol and just give a number in terms of pi. Complex shapes are um, cubes, rectangular prisms, cones as well. Uh, I think I've actually written them out on the next slide, which ones. So you need to know the formulas to calculate the area of common shapes, like a sphere, uh, a triangle, the area of a triangle, and a cone. So these are the different formulas you should know. Basically, I think sometimes they give you them, but for a circle's diameter and a circle's area, it's not common for them to give that in the question. Volume of a sphere, maybe they'll give you this. Um, not always. So this is something you simply need to make sure you remember. and. For the triangle's area, it's a half times the base times the height. Now, what I would recommend you guys do is wherever you practice for the UCAT, you have a piece of paper and you have these formulas written out on them. Okay, just stick it on the wall or something so it's there as a reminder. And I imagine you'll be practicing for a couple of weeks for the UCAT exam. Literally seeing these formulas every day on the piece of paper will automatically like get them into your memory uh, just after using them over and over again. So in the beginning, if you're not familiar with these, feel free to just kind of use a piece of paper. But over time, try to get used to just doing these from memory. And towards the end of the exam, kind of hide them so that you can't see them. I'm gonna go through keyboard shortcuts towards the end of today. I would do the same thing with keyboard shortcuts. I would have them on a piece of paper and I would stick them on the wall and I'll try to use them wherever you can. 
in the beginning, it's going to feel a bit weird having to look at the sheet and then check which one you're pressing, but over time it will get easier. So make sure you use keyboard shortcuts and these formulas for whatever, whichever questions. Um, and that's what I just said. So keep a piece of paper with you, have them everything right now, and you should naturally learn those. This is what I was mentioning before. You, there is no pi button in the exam. You're not expected to know the whole of pi's number. So in some questions, the answer will be written as eight pi or seven pi, like the answer will be given like this. So if that's the case, you don't need to use 3.14. You just need to um, calculate what the number before pi would be. Uh, other questions will tell you, use pi as 3.14 or 3.415. Oh, there's a question there. Uh, that's the next question. So I'm going to give you guys another 40 seconds. So relaunch the poll and 40 seconds is starting now. Okay, that's 40 seconds up. Let's give you a few more seconds. I can see some of you are putting answers in. So the majority of you have got the correct answer, which is D, 76 square inches. Okay, so just to calculate this one, you're looking at what is the total area of the cardboard pieces required to make the lid? Now, imagine this is, imagine this is a, an actual box with the lid, the face on top, this one here, is six by eight, that's 48. This strip on the side, on the width of the box, this is eight inches, it's a length actually, that's eight inches by one inch. So there's eight times one, give you eight. And the one on this side is six times one, it'll give you six. But remember, this is a box, there are four sides, and there are two sides that you cannot see. So it's gonna be six for the strip on this side, six on this side, eight, at the front and eight at the back plus 48. So that's all of those added together and that gives you 76. So um, this is not drawn to scale or anything. Um, that one looks shorter than this one. Uh, but yeah, this is gonna take a bit of, I guess, practice and um, they can kind of throw anything at you. In this one, the inches, the, the units are the same. Everything is in inches. So there's nothing to convert, but keep an eye on these ones. Sometimes it might say, uh, one centimeter and at the bottom it might tell you that how many centimeters is equal to how many inches for the conversion rate. Okay, next section is averages and ranges, mean, median, and mode. This is quite a, I'm sure everyone's heard of these. So the mean of a set of data, so you add everything together and you divide by the number of values. I have 10 values, add them all together, divided by 10, that gives you the mean. Uh, the mode, this is the most repeated number in a data set, and it's when, um, yeah, the most repeated number in a data set. So if there's a group of students and they've picked their favorite color, the color with the most uh, numbers is the mode. And then median, this is the middle number in a data set with all numer uh, data in numerical order. That's important that things are in order for the median. So information for these questions can be presented in so many ways. You might get a diagram, a chart, a table, or even plain text. These plain text questions are quite difficult. It's literally just a sentence and it's telling you in the sentence like what the, uh, what the data is. If you get sentences like that, I don't know if you guys are all like me, but I'm quite a visual person with maths. I like to see the data. So if there's, if there's a sentence given to me in an exam question, I will kind of write down scribble notes as I'm doing it. Um, if that works for you, definitely advise to do that. So we're gonna do another example question for this. What time are we on? It's eight o'clock, seven. It's been about an hour. I think after we do this question, we'll take a seven minute break. Um, and then we'll come back to finish off the rest. So we restart the poll and then you'll have another 40 seconds. Just like before.
Okay, 40 seconds starts now. Okay, that's 40 seconds up. And the poll, so a big majority, 71% of you have gone for D as the answer. And that's the correct answer. So well done if you got the correct answer. Um, I'm guessing this one is an easy one for you guys because most of you got this. So basically, in her secondary university, Linda scores 99 points in P5. You know, this is one of those questions where they give the sentence. I didn't like the way they worded it. I would prefer to kind of draw this out myself. But yeah, she got 99 in her second year in P5, which is one of the exams, I'm guessing. What's the difference between her P5 score and the second year and her average project score in first year? So you just find the average between these four numbers, add them together, divide by four, and it gives you 95, uh, 94, sorry. 99 minus 94, five points, and that's D. Okay, time practice is cool. So just to recap, we've gone through basic arithmetic. So your basic addition, subtraction. I've shown you the kind of framework for simple and complex questions. And then we've gone through proportionality, percentages, ratios, speed, distance, and time, as well as the acceleration, and then money exchange rates, in geometry and then averages. So you guys can see there's a lot of different question types. There's one more question type which wasn't on the UCAT website. I struggled to find an example of. It's not really a common one, but if you guys come across it, make sure you're familiar with this one as well. It's about train times. So you get these questions where it shows you the train time calendar and it asks you about if this train leaves at this time, how long will it take to get to this one? I'm not sure if the UCAT does those questions as much anymore. Um, I did mine a couple of years ago. Maybe they've changed it by now, but um, that's another question that, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, when you guys come back, we're gonna take a seven minute break now. We'll be doing timed practice questions. We're not gonna do loads. I know we've been through so many so far. What I want you guys to know is, feel is like how doing like four or five in a row. So when we come back, there's just five questions and we're gonna do them all in a row. So I'm gonna give you 40 seconds for all five. Uh, one after another, and then we'll go through the um, the answers for them. In those seven minutes, please take an actual break. Go do something relaxing, stretch your legs, have some water, um, and we'll meet back here afterwards. Seven minutes over. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to do five timed practice questions. These are five questions in a row. They are using the same data set. So what you'll find is when you do the actual exam, for each of the data sets that they give you, you often get five or maybe three questions on the same data set. And as you do those five questions on that set of data, sometimes the answers or the calculations that you use for the first question, they might be useful in the second question or in the third. So you may have added all of the numbers together in a table, and you might need that for the third question as well as the first. So if you kind of do a calculation, sort of organize your notes in a way on your uh, whiteboard and pen, so that if you need the numbers again, you can reuse them basically. So there are five questions, one, two, three, okay, four questions that we're gonna do here. They're gonna be timed. So I'm gonna give you 40 seconds per question. And I'm gonna, after 40 seconds, we'll just move straight on to the next one. So this is four questions in a row, and then we're gonna go through the answers for all four. Because it's four in a row, we're not gonna do the poll. Okay, we're just gonna, I'll just, just write them down on your own piece of paper at home and just keep a track of what you put for A, B, one, two, three, and four. And then, um, then we'll get going. Okay, hopefully you all had a good break and you're ready. So 40 seconds for the first question. It's gonna start in about, I'll give you 10 seconds, 10 second warning. So 10 seconds and then we'll start. So as soon as the first 40 seconds has been done, I'll let you guys know, and then we'll move on to the next. 
So question one is here. 40 seconds. Okay, that's question two now, it's 40 seconds done for the first. Okay, that's the second set of 40 seconds done. Now you're onto your third question, another 40 seconds here. Okay, and that's the final question. 40 seconds and then we'll do the answers. Okay, that's 40 seconds up for the last one as well. Um, hopefully you guys managed to get through those. Don't worry if you didn't, um, I'll explain why in a second, but we're gonna go through the answers for the four questions. So this is question one, is asking about the, how much did the population of the island increase between 1973 and 1983? Um, hopefully you've used the tips I mentioned earlier and read the question before looking at the data. So read this, you need to know it's 1973 to 83, which is these two here and you're looking at the change in the population of the island. Now, this is a moment where you need to pay attention to the units, okay? So you can see here in the table, it says total number of households in thousands, average number, average household size, so number of people. So this is meant, this is representing 41,000 houses and an average of 7.5 people per home. So the calculation you would do here is 41,000 times by 7.5, to get the population in 1973, and then you would do 54,000 times 5.8 to get the um, to get the population for 1983, and that is 307,500. Take away 313,200. The other way around, and that gives you an answer of 5,700. Okay, so the main point to take away from this is not exactly how to do the question, but this part here. Okay the units, thousands and number of people. You can see in the answer as well, if you got the units wrong and you use the number 51, 54, uh, 54 and 41, you would have ended up with this answer here, 570. All right, and that's there to trip you up. And uh, there's that as well, insufficient information. Question two, oh, sorry, this is the working out for that question. So I've just spoken through this. So that's 1973, 41,000 households, average 7.5 and uh, and that's your final calculation. This was question two. So the correct answer for this one was D. So this is a ratio question. Um, there's actually a trick to answer this one. The calculation, so the answer they've given is quite a long-winded way of working this out. I'll show you a shortcut basically. 
So if the ratio of males to females on the island in 1993 was 45 to 55, how many more females than males were living there? So male to female, 45 to 55. Females are 55 and males are 45 here. These two add up to 100. Okay, 45 at 55 is 100. So out of 100, females represent 55, which is basically, you can do this as a percentage. Okay, since the two ratios add up to 100, corresponds to um, a percentage. So 55% women, 45% men. The difference between the two is what you're trying to figure out, right? You want to know um, how many more females than males are there. The difference is 10%. Instead of working out what they've done, which is 45% and then 55%, you can simply just work out 10% and that is the answer. So instead of doing that long calculation that they've written out here, just do, I've written this down now, 71,000. So you're looking for 1993. So you wanna know how many people, what the population was, which is 71,000 times by four. And that gives you 284,000. So there's 284,000 people. And all you need to figure out is what 10% of that number is. So you divide it by 10. And that gives you 28,400. So that's literally the first the calculation, 71,000 times four. And the second one, dividing 284,000 by 10, you can do that in your head, just knock off a zero. Okay, so although the UCAT gives you, this is up from their official website, right? This is the calculation that they've given as the answer. You can see there's a shortcut. Okay, so try and use these shortcuts, try and spot where you can kind of do um, a quicker way to kind of get through it. Question number three. So this was, how many of the increased number of one person households in 2009 involved a surviving relative who had previously been part of a two person household? <laughs> Such a wordy question. And <laughs> I'm sure you guys, uh, hopefully you could tell, you can't do this question. Um, insufficient information. Um, there is no indication of who had lived previously in a two person household. It just gives you numbers and tells you how many people are in each year. Um, for this type of question, if you kind of come across this, this is where you want to actually read the first sentence. So far in question two and question one, you literally don't need this first sentence. You know the data, the, you just need the table. But question three is where maybe you would want to have a quick glance and check. Okay, does it say anything about people who have previously lived in a two-person household? They haven't, so the correct answer is E. And question four, the correct answer here was C, 10,395. I don't expect any of you to have gotten this question, to be honest. If you did, well done. But this is a long question. Look how many calculations there are. There's one, two, three, four, there's, there's multiple. Earlier on, I told you that if you find a simple question in the exam, you do it. And if you find a complex question, you just guess, flag, and move on. This is a good example of a complex question. It's not that difficult if you're given the time, but 40 seconds for this, just for one mark, it's really not worth your time in the exam. So if any of you did kind of notice that whilst you were doing this, this is the type of question where you come, you come to this in the UCAT exam immediately, flag, guess the question, move on. Don't waste your time on this, okay? Do the easy questions first because there are a number of easy ones in there. Finish them all, guarantee those marks, then go back to these questions. And you probably will have time to get through a few of them, maybe all. Um, I don't think we went through it today, but you guys, are aware that when you're marked in the UCAT, it's from 300 to 900. You don't need to get full marks to get 900. Um, it's a very weird method of marking, but you don't need full marks, okay? So don't worry about getting like full, full marks. As long as you got like 90% of the questions, your score is stupidly high anyway. So that's where a question like this, probably not worth your time, uh, especially with that many calculations. Um, you can see this question, this one, and this one, relatively simple, small, calculations compared to that one there. So that's the last of the practice questions from today. Um, you guys can put away your calculators, your pen and paper. At the end, when we do the Q&A, if anyone wants to ask any questions on these, do let me know. Um, now we're gonna go into keyboard shortcuts. Now, I don't think everyone uses these. I know people have done the UCAT without keyboard shortcuts, but honestly, you should. They're very simple. Um, you guys will be given these slides, by the way, after today. So don't worry about scribbling these down right now. Uh, same goes for anything that I've said. You'll get given the slides. You can go through them in your own pace. Um, I would write these down on a piece of paper. I don't have it with me at the moment. I literally have my UCAT notes. Um, that's where I got the shortcuts from. I wrote these down on a piece of paper with a marker pen in a bright green color. And I stuck them on the wall 
and I just made sure that I used them. Um, it was a bit tricky at first, but you can see most of the letters correspond to what they do. And N for next, P for previous, F for flag, A for review, all. V, which is the only one that doesn't uh, correspond to the letter for reviewing flagged questions. And then I for reviewing incomplete. Here's what you should do after your exam. On each section, as you come to the last question and you finish them, the first thing you should do is Alt I, okay, review incomplete. That means you haven't put an answer for that question. The reason you should do that is just in case you actually missed, maybe you didn't click properly or something like that. Um, if there's an incomplete one, check those first. Once you've reviewed your incomplete answers, then you want to go straight to flagged, okay? Review flagged, Alt V. So you finish your questions, it's Alt I. Do Make sure you check the incomplete, then it's Alt V, check you've done the flagged ones. And then if you have time after finishing the flagged questions, you can review all. And this is where you would, it's unlikely you're going to have time to do this, but this is where you would kind of check your answers. Um, but yeah, get comfortable using these. Uh, when you use the official UCAT website and a couple of others, the shortcuts work on the, on the, the, on the website. So that's why it's kind of recommended to use some sort of question bank, which has the sh shortcuts built in so that you can practice for the exam. Um, yeah, that's that. My advice. Yeah, cool. All right, I'm going to give you my advice now. So I've been giving you tips throughout today. Um, I'm going to give you some advice kind of tailored to the QR section, but also just in general. Um, I've mentioned some of these before today, but I'm just going to go over them again so that you guys remember. Read the end part of the question first before checking the data. Okay. You, probably noticed by now that you often don't need to read the first few sentences you just need the final question and the data and you can figure out the answer okay it's all about saving time right that's the number one key in the UCAT that's the main takeaway today is how can I do this question as quickly as possible and get it correct so read the question first the final part which is like sorry about that guys um don't know what happened to the mic but anyway um triage questions so earlier on, you guys remember, I showed you a flowchart and I said, if you come across a simple question, do the question. And if you come across a complex question, guess, flag and move on. Okay, please get used to doing that. Do not put yourself through doing two or three calculations for a question. It's simply not worth the time. You will have time to come back to it if you quickly do the question and move on. So when I say, um, when I say guess, I don't mean you fully read the question, literally just click an answer and go. Um, because it's a waste of time. In the time that you do something with two or three calculations, you could have got yourself three extra marks. And if you compare two people, one person who uses this technique of flagging and skipping questions and somebody else who just works through them one by one, the person who flags them and moves forward will always do better. And you can try this yourself. Do a mock and do it without flagging and skipping and then do it with flagging and skipping and you'll see a difference. Um, Practice GCSE maths questions for anything you struggle with. Honestly, I can't recommend this enough. Um, I don't really remember seeing this online much with advice, but it's something I just did myself. Um, I just, it's how I've always learned maths. If you're someone who's, if you're a maths kind of person, you'll know that the best way to learn math is simply repeat, just do it over and over and over again. And sooner or later, the questions just become routine. And that's what you want with all of these different ones. So anything that you find yourself struggling with. So when you're doing your mocks and your practice questions, if you find that you avoid the ratio type questions or the percentages, or if there's something that you see and it brings you dread, that's where you need to focus. Okay, where your weak points is where you need to build up your knowledge, your routine of doing the right calculations. So if you struggle anywhere, put your focus there, do some practice GCSE questions, only for like literally 15, 20 minutes. Just do some from Google and then come back to the UCAT and you should see an improvement. It's the final thing. You should just replicate the exam at home. Okay, if you're doing an exam at home, make sure you don't have your phone with you. Make sure you're not snacking and stuff. Treat it like it's an actual UCAT exam, okay? No distractions. Try your best if you, if you have, you know, a laptop or a computer at home, preferably a computer, because if you guys are familiar with keyboards, <clears throat> I can't show you my own keyboard, but <clears throat> the larger keyboards, especially the one in the exam, will have a number key on the right-hand side. So it'll have the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine that's what you're going to be using to do the calculator it's um fairly quick there's a multiplication divide addition and subtraction button as well and there's an enter button if you can get used to using that at home 
or wherever you practice. It will set you up very nicely for the real exam. And the same goes for using a whiteboard and pen. Obviously, if you don't have a whiteboard and pen, pen and paper is the next best thing, but try to use what you will have in the exam at home when you practice. And use keyboard shortcuts. So they're included in these slides. Um, there's calculate shortcuts as well, which we're going to go through in a second. So I'll talk you through those, but the keyboard shortcuts I showed you before, as well as the calculator shortcuts, make sure you're using those as well. They, they, it's called a micro efficiency. It's when you're saving time, but the time you're saving is like less than a second. They don't really seem like they're significant, but when you add up all of the different seconds that you save up, it collectively adds up to 30, 40, 50 seconds. And that is a lot of time in a UK exam. My advice continued. So practice in timed conditioned always. So uh, conditions. So you guys have seen that with the QR section, the difficulty level is GCSE level. It doesn't exceed GCSE actually. You don't need a level math level to learn to do any of this. That's why I recommend you just do it in a timed condition. If you just do the questions and you don't give yourself 40 seconds or 50 seconds or a limit, you're naturally, you'll get the questions correct. Like given enough time, you will, but it's just gonna you know, shoot you in the foot for the exam because if you're used to doing the questions with one minute, one and a half minutes or two minutes, when you get to the exam, 40 seconds is gonna go like this. And if you're not used to that, it's, you're never gonna learn how to do it in that much time. Try not to be disheartened by getting low scores, getting questions incorrect, making mistakes. What I always tell all the students that I've mentored with absolutely anything, and this is not just for UCAT exams or just anything in general. Anytime you make a mistake, if anything, it should make you a bit happy because a mistake you make whilst practicing is a mistake that you're not going to make in the exam. Because when you're practicing, it's a safe environment to make mistakes. Okay, It wouldn't really be practice if you got everything right and you just got 100%. Because if you're getting 100% constantly in practice, you're not pushing yourself past your boundaries, you're not testing your limits, and you're not really learning, right? So expect to get things wrong. And wherever you do make a mistake, correct it. And make sure that you're thinking, okay, next time I come across this type of question or this, uh, this kind of mistake that I've just made, I'm going to do this instead to make sure it doesn't happen in the real exam. Practice every day. So one of the common, one of the most common, I guarantee someone will ask this as well in the Q&A. Oh, how long should I study for the UCAT and whatnot? Um, how long is very subjective. How many hours a day is very subjective. It differs from person to person. But the one thing I would recommend everybody does is practice every day. Okay, consistency is so much more important uh, in the long run in improving your score. If Even if you're doing like 10 minutes a day, it's better than taking days off, okay? And it's doing 10 minutes every day for a week is better than having one day where you do two hours. Okay, because if you're doing it every single day, you're sleeping in between those days. And whilst you're sleeping without getting too scientific, there's a lot of brain connections and rewiring that happens whilst you sleep. So if you're doing something every day, the skills and the your kind of memory processing and all that stuff, it, it accelerates and it's better for you. So practice every day, okay? Try not to take days off. Um, actually, you know, take days off wherever you need them, but um, try to keep it consistent rather than doing one day and then taking a week off and then doing another day. Because if you've had a week, you haven't done anything, you come back to it and it's all, it's all new to you again and you've kind of lost the rhythm and the routine that you had. Uh, focus on your weaknesses. There'll come a point for most of you where you're doing the UCAT and you see the steady level of improvement and then you plateau. And it's very normal for this to happen. Towards the end of your studying stage, you'll find that you kind of reach a point where you maybe hit a certain score and you're just struggling to get over that score. At that point, it's where you really need to focus on your weaknesses, okay? So this isn't just for the QR section in general, but all of the four sections, if you find that you're trying to get your overall score is just st is stuck at and it's not going past a certain point, look at the one section of the four or five, which is the lowest. The one which is the lowest or the one area of the QR section where you're performing the worst types of questions that you keep getting wrong, that's where you have the most room for improvement, right? So that's where you should focus. That's where you should think, okay, what's going wrong here? Why is this one not going up as much? It's easier to build your score on something that you've got like two questions. If you've only got like one question correct from the percentages, it's easier to bring that up to three, four or five versus if you're amazing at fractions and ratios and you're getting like 90% of those correct, right? Trying to improve that 90 to 100, 
is a, is much harder than going from one question correct to a couple more. This is one thing I did, which is amazing, right? Every time I made a mistake, the smallest things like misread the units on a question, or if I um, didn't convert from meters to centimeters, or if I um, didn't refer back to the sentence before the data for something, every time I made a mistake in the UCAT, not just for the QR section, for verbal reasoning, for decision-making, all of the others, I kept a specific sheet, just a piece of paper, and it, was, it literally just said uh, QR mistakes. And I would make a note of the mistake. And if I did the mistake more than once, I would use a tally chart next to the mistake. So let's say I did a percentage, I don't know, an increase, and I did it incorrectly. And I did it three times. I would have three lines next to it. And over three or four weeks, you'll notice that you probably have some mistakes that you keep on making. And after, you can only figure that out by keeping a sheet like this, keeping track of what you're doing wrong. And after a few weeks, you see the patterns and you're like, okay, that's where I'm stepping up, right? And I said that you need to focus on your weaknesses because that's where you're going to improve the most. So this sheet is kind of like a, a hack to find out what your weaknesses are without actually doing intensive research or anything on yourself. Um, eyeballing, this is another piece of advice. I don't know if I, I must, I think I mentioned this today. So basically eyeballing is where you're narrowing down an answer purely from eyeballing the data and the set of answers. What I mean by this is today we did a question earlier on. Uh, I think the question was adding, it was, and it, yeah, it was the, it was the first question of today, actually. Should I go back to it? I don't believe it. Um, the question was adding 480 to 460. And I remember telling you guys that in the answers, there was no answer above, there's only one answer, which was above 400. That's called eyeballing. When you look at the answer, you don't calculate it, but you're just looking at it and you're like, it has to be that one. Like it literally can't be less than 700. So it must be this answer. That's something that you should get used to doing. There are so many questions in the UCAT, which you can use the calculator for, but you can also eyeball. And if you can eyeball the question, you can answer it without doing any calculations, just by looking at it. And that saves you five or 10 seconds where you would be typing on the calculator and then checking the answer. So that's the same thing. You can eliminate, eliminate answers just by eyeballing. So I've got an example here. For example, if the question asks about a person's tax and their income is 20,000 pounds, the answers are likely to be less than 20,000. Um, this is another thing to also simple. Yeah, so with eyeballing, in simple calculations, rounding numbers can help you in eyeballing. So if you need to do 34 times 11 for a question, do 35, do 35 times 10 quickly. That's 350. Uh, no, it's not. It's, but yes, it is 350. <laughs> And uh, eyeball and see if you can spot the answer just by doing that, because that's giving you a rough estimate of what the answer should be. And if you find that all of the answers are like very far away from that number, except one, you can be rest assured that that's probably the correct answer. So that's how eyeballing works. It's something that you're going to get used to with practice. So as you go through questions, try and as you're checking them and checking the answers, just keep that in your mind. Where can I eyeball for questions? And you'll notice that sometimes you actually do it without thinking about it. So um, it's very helpful. That's all my advice so far for that. Um, I think maybe in the Q&A in the Q&A today, because I want to get through the QR section first, I'll give you guys some advice for just all the sections in general, but because this is the QR section, we're going to keep it so, uh, just with QR. And we're going to move on to the calculator. So the calculator is uh, it's online in the exam, so it's on the computer, but don't rely on the calculator. Okay, do simple calculations in your head. Because um, using the calculator will waste too much time. If you're trying to add 20 plus 10, 20 plus 5, 6 plus 7, you should be doing these in your head. It saves you time having to check them on the calculator. Um, I know how it feels in exams. I kind of had this toxic trait of just checking every single calculation on the calculator. I'd be questioning myself, oh my God, is 10 plus 10 actually 20? Am I, am I tripping? Or don't do that in this exam, okay? <laughs> Simple calculations, do them in your head. All right, and that will save you so much time. Turn off number lock. I don't know if you guys know what number lock is, but hopefully you do. On a, a computer with a full key, uh, keyboard, which will be given to you in your exam, there's number lock, which lets you use the keypad of numbers on the right-hand side. So I think you press number lock or unclick it, and it lets you use those numbers. That's how you input. That's, how you, that's the quickest way to type in numbers onto a calculator rather than using the numbers above the letters on a laptop. Um, that's the micro efficiency. So it's like, it's going to save you a couple of seconds here and there, but it will add up in the end. At that table below is 
all of the calculator shortcuts. They look kind of confusing. So I think I use these, yeah, M plus. So it saves the positive version of the current number to memory. So let's say you've done a calculation and you need to keep the number which is on the screen. As the number is on the screen, press M plus and it will save the number as a positive. If you're, what's the best way to explain this? Basically, if you've calculated a number and you need to subtract that number from something else. So if I did five plus five equals 10, and I need to do 100 take away 10, but I'm not gonna remember 10 because it's a very complex number or something. I would press M minus, and this would save minus 10 on the memory of the calculator. So you do five plus five equals 10, and then you press M minus on the calculator, and that will save minus 10. So then I type in 100, and all I have to do is press MRC, memory recall. So what MRC does is whatever you have saved under M minus or M plus, it will come onto the screen when you press MRC. So if I've saved minus 10, I type in 100, then I press MRC and it will automatically deduct 10. And if you press MRC and an M minus, this will clear the memory. So just to reiterate, you can only save one number at a time, either M plus or M minus, whichever one you press. And by pressing MRC, it will bring the number back to the screen. So I'll do a quick demo just to show you guys. Where are we at? This is just screen. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see my screen. This is the calculator on screen right now. This is what the UCAT website looks like, by the way. Um, here is MRC, M minus, and M plus. So I'll give you that example. So five plus five equals 10. Now let's say I need to do 100. I need to take this number away from 100. So because I'm taking it away, I want it saved as a negative. So I press M minus. And this M has come up in the corner, which means it's saved. Now I can press on as many times as I like. You can see there's an M in the corner. That means that a number has been saved on the memory. So I type 100, then I press MRC for memory recall. And it has, you can see it's put a minus sign for 10. Danish, sorry to interrupt. You're not actually sharing your screen at the minute. Oh. Um, all we can see is a video of you. There we sorry. are. Sorry, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> okay, sorry about that guys. Let's try that again. So same example as before. So if we do five plus five, this gives you 10. So I have 10 here. Now let's say I'm in the exam and I want to do 100 take away 10. And this is the number on screen 10. I'm taking this away in the next calculation. I press M minus. Now this M has shown up in the corner and that indicates that this number has been saved into the calculator's memory. So you can press the C and the on button go back to zero. You can do whatever calculations you want to do, right? And then you cut to the 100. And now I want to take away that number I had before, which I saved. I can't remember what it was. So I use the memory, M minus. Press M minus. Wait, sorry, 100. Bear with me, I think I've done something wrong here. M minus, cool. So 100, then you press M minus. I think, when I, sh I think when I shared my screen, I did something here. Okay, five plus five equals M minus, saved. Then you press 100 and you press MRC. That's a mistake I made. So. When you want to bring back the number that you saved, you press MRC. So I've saved minus 10. I've got 100 here. Press MRC and it takes away the 10 for me. And I press equals. I'm guessing you have to press minus. 
Uh, okay. okay, so sorry about that, guys. Slight confusion there. So the number that's saved is minus 10. So if I type 100 and I want to add that number or take away the number, I can add minus 10. So I can add and I press MRC to bring back the number. And then it takes up the 90. And then to cancel anything, so I, you, you have the M in the corner. If you want to remove whatever whatever's in the memory, press MRC and then press M minus and then the M has gone. That means your memory is clear now. So we'll do another example, three plus three equals six. And I want to save the number six. So that number is saved, I press M plus. And I've got another number, 12. And I want to take off the number that I put in memory. So I take away, I press MRC, memory recall. Six comes up, it's 12 take away six is six. Um, so that's the calculator. Um, and the shortcut for calculator is letter C, but I don't think it works on this website for me. Um, but in the, in the exam, you press the letter C and it will come up. And what you should do before you start is just move the calculator kind of out of the way, because it can sometimes get in the way of the, the writing or the question. <laughs>